Can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, so we'll uh, give you a very brief introduction before we actually get into the uh, core of the matter and the technical presentations. Um, this is the first of uh, hopefully a new and long-lasting series of uh, workshops related to computation and modeling. And um, basically, many of you are already familiar, maybe, maybe not, with the NNIN, the National Nanotechnology Infrastructure Network. That's a network of 14 different facilities that's funded by NSF and that's initially focused on making nanotechnology related resources available to researchers. So one big element of that are fabrication resources for those of you who are familiar with the LNF, the clean room here, the Lurie Nano Fabrication Facility. That's one aspect of it. But there is also a computational aspect of the NNIN program in the same direction, that is making computational resources available to researchers. The four sites that are focused on that computation program are Harvard, Stanford, Cornell, and Michigan. And this is something relatively new for us. Um, as part of our focus, uh, again, some of it is on fabrication, um, not surprisingly, MEMS, BioMEMS, etc. But we also have some activities related to geological science, environmental sciences, and this activity on computation and modeling, um, again, MEMS, NEMS, and micro and nanofluidics. So that's something, that's a program that is starting for Michigan, uh, but that hopefully as time goes, uh, you will have the opportunity of having more interactions with our computational coordinator, Dr. Shieri, who you may have met already. Um, and then through these kind of workshops and presentations that we will have um, on a semi-regular basis. Okay, there was, um, I'll continue. I'll do the slide switching. <coughs> uh, what's NNINC at Michigan? Uh, as you see, we provide uh, consulting, computation, and software support to you for to, and MEMS Society. And uh, uh, here, uh, as you see, we have all groups of uh, modeling techniques uh, and uh, Micro technology or MEMS uh, lands in this area. We are lucky, then we can use finite element methods and other uh, continuum approaches. But for nanotechnology and MEMS, we have to use expensive uh, molecular dynamics, for example, simulation, or uh, um, develop new approaches like multi scale methods. One uh, our job is to provide tools. Uh, unite different size and time scales, like uh, multi-scale tools. Um, if you check our website, we are trying to collect all multi-scale tools uh, for NEMS applications. And also we provide software packages for multi-physics couplings, uh, couplings between different uh, fields and different disciplines. Uh, Carpenter is a good example. And also, we want to uh, support you to modify your codes. If you want to write a new code, uh, we are here to help you. Or if you want to uh, develop a new approach, again, we are here to help you. <coughs> and uh, also, we have our uh, uh, cluster, computation cluster. We call it uh, MNC2. And we have 168 cores ready for your large simulations. And it's easy to contact us. Uh, go to this uh, address and open an account. Uh, we contact you if you have a pro any problem related to modeling and simulation or using or a cluster for a large simulation. We, we uh, make an appointment with you and we talk about your problem and we solve your problem. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, or uh, guests from Coventer for today's workshop.
supposed to put it? No, in your pocket. Commercial software and open source software. It doesn't matter. We, are, we, are, we provide both type of software packages. And you can discuss that more during the break, maybe. Um, I think we'll get started now. Morning, everybody. Uh, let's see, is this, am I amplified? Good? Sounds like it. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm Steve Bright. Um, I'm the VP of Engineering for Coventer. I've been with uh, Coventer for 10 years now, um, responsible for um, supervising the development of all of Coventer's software products. And um, prior to, I've had a long and varied career. Um, I have my PhD from MIT in uh, ocean engineering, or ship design. And uh, I went from ship design into underwater acoustics and from there into uh, high performance computing and uh, then into speech recognition. And then it turned out that the um, techniques that we use at Coventer for electrostatics, boundary element modeling, are the same as the techniques that are used in um, modeling uh, water wave interactions with ships, boundary element methods. And my best buddy and uh, office mate from MIT days uh, recruited me to join Coventer. So I, I tell people that I went from ships to chips. It's only one letter different. So, uh, and with me today is Sham Venegopal. Uh, Sham, you'll put up your name at the beginning so people can see how it's spelled. And uh, Sham's been an application engineer with Coventer for about five years now? Six years. Wow, time flies. So he's uh, responsible for helping um, our customers, both commercial and universities, on the east coast of the, uh, the eastern half of the United States. So he's had a lot of experience engaging uh, both with uh, universities and some of our uh, commercial customers like analog devices. So we put up, uh, we tried to think we are going to be doing a lot of talking today. The sign-up showed that there were about 50 or 60 people for this workshop. And usually when we do hands-on <coughs> training, it's for a smaller group, 10 people, 15 people. And then we like to have a ratio of uh, three or four students per instructor. So that obviously wasn't going to work too well today. Um, so what we've decided to do is for uh, this morning, we're going to uh, do a combination of presentations and demonstrations. And then we'll continue uh, introducing. So the first session, I'm going to give you an overview of the MEMS market, what part of it Coventerware is focusing on, because obviously MEMS covers a big space, lots of different kinds of devices. Um, and we do have a definite focus within the MEMS market. Um, and we're uh, especially focused on trying to, there's a growing demand for MEMS, and a, it looks like a uh, inflection point, as they say, where the uh, volume of MEMS production is, is uh, bound to increase um, much more than it has in the past due to the adoption of MEMS in consumer electronics devices, and especially cell phones. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And I'm going to then introduce um, our latest product. I'll give you an overview of Coventerware, which is our flagship product. And a lot of people are familiar with that's been around the longest. And then I'll introduce our uh, latest product, which is called MEMS Plus. And um, Sham is then going to do a, a, an extended demo of MEMS Plus. Then we'll take a break. Um, I'll come back and give you a more detailed presentation on Coventerware. 
uh, which has a lot of functionality in it, a lot of value, and uh, followed by a, another live demo showing the same problem that we analyzed in MEMS Plus. We'll do the same problem in um, CoVenorware. Then we'll take a lunch break. We'll be around to uh, talk with you and answer any questions. And uh, the, the third product that we offer, Simulator 3D, we'll give an, a quick uh, introduction to that in the afternoon. Uh, followed by another live demo. And then we thought, well, how do we best help you? And what we're going to do is have open office hours for the Coventer people. We'd like you to, um, what we'd like to do is engage on a smaller group basis with folks on the problems that are of interest to you to make sure that uh, you understand what Coventerware could do for you. So you might be an existing Coventerware user or a user of Simulator 3D here who has some particular issues and wants to ask us questions, that's great. Uh, or you might uh, be curious about what we could do for your particular um, the challenge that you're trying to uh, simulate. So we have a sign-up sheet here with 15-minute time slots. And um, we have individual sheets here where we'd like you to put, put in your um, in case we have too many sign-ups for these 15-minute time slots, we'd ask um, no more than, since there are two of us, two um, people or groups, if you can group together, can sign up per 15-minute time slot. We, we'll split up if we have to. Um, but we'd ask that before the lunch break, you take one of these sheets and uh, fill in your, ask for your name, phone number, so that if you're wandering around or we're a little late, we can just give you phone a call. I assume you all have cell phones now. Um, what your affiliation is, since I know there are uh, multiple universities um, participating in, in this center. Um, and then we'd like you to give us uh, as much of a description of you, as you can of what you're trying to do and uh, what, uh, what you'd like to simulate or where you're having issues with Come Anywhere. Um, so just a quick show of hands, how many people think they'll be interested in signing up for those sessions? Okay, don't be shy. It's not like seeing a professor, you know, we're, we're less, in, less in intimidating than professors. Okay. Um, well, I hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity for us to work one-on-one uh, -on -one with you or one-on small group with you and we'll try to stick to the set schedule so you'll know um, when you have to show up for that session. Um, so again, you'll sign up uh, hopefully before lunch and that's just to give us an idea to help us prep who's going to help who because we have different areas of knowledge. Um, and I guess the other question to answer is many of you asked, do we need our notebooks this morning? The answer is uh, not unless you want to take notes from what, I, what I'm saying. Um, we're, it's going to be presentation and demos, so sit back and ra relax this morning. This afternoon, if you come for a support session, by all means bring your notebook and give us a little presentation or show us. It's, it's always easier to d discuss something, especially in engineering, if you have some graphics to look at. So whatever you have to show, um, we'd be uh, pleased to look at. So any, any questions about the agenda before I move on? Okay. All right, so I'll give you a very quick company background, talk about the market, the MEMS market, uh, show you some of the uh, data that we see from their various companies that survey the market and as a, as a uh, for-profit company, we're, we're interested in where that market is going and how our, what Coventer's mission is now as, as we uh, address that market and then give you this overview of our three our, uh, product platforms. So Coventer started, uh, was founded in 1996 by um, an EDA veteran. EDA is electronic design automation, uh, just a little history around the early 90s. Um, Prior, prior to 1990, um, companies that were producing electronics mostly used, uh, they, they had to develop their own software tools because they just didn't exist. And some of those tools actually still existed companies, their homegrown 
simulators that uh, some of the bigger companies use. But in the 1990s, there was an a, a explosion of electronic design automation software companies that addressed that need. And Coventer's founder, Mike Jemilkowski, was uh, in one of those companies that was eventually acquired and decided to look around for the next big thing and um, went to some conferences and ended up connecting with John Gilbert, who was uh, a postdoc in Steve Centuria's lab at MIT in the mid-90s. And they together started Coventerware. Uh, Coventer, it was then known as Microcosm Technologies. Um, and it started really with the uh, prototype software that John Gilbert had developed at MIT for doing coupled electromechanics using a hybrid approach where you have uh, finite element software doing the mechanics and boundary elements doing the electrostatics. Those initial products as we went through the 90s and into the early part of the 2000s were really focused at MEMS experts used for device design, modeling, and simulation, and for process development. And we've, uh, over that time, 15, some 15 years now, developed a, a worldwide reputation. Our software is used at um, 11 of the top 15 MEMS companies as rated by uh, YOL development. And we'll see some other YOL development data in a, in a minute. Um, and it's used at uh, hundreds of universities and research centers around the world. So it's a, Covent the name Coventer is certainly well known and Coventerware is well known around the world. So let's look at some market data. This is, again, Yole Development's a French outfit that has specialized in the MEMS market. Uh, they've now expanded into uh, some tangential areas that aren't uh, traditional semiconductors. And I don't know how well you'll be able to see this list on the, on the left, so I'll give a little guidance. So you see, right now we're kind of uh, holding our own. Everybody's having a hard time because of the, uh, the Great Recession. Uh, but there is a forecast for a pickup this year already and um, increasing demand for total demand. So this is in uh, billions of dollars. So it's around a approaching, expected to approach 14, 13, 14 billion dollar market the year after next. And if we look at the list of devices that comprise that market, um, Coventer has focused the, the devices that are sort of classical MEMS, and I, I would include things like uh, micro displays, that means the uh, DLP projectors of which we're probably using one here, um, made by Texas Instruments there um, for a long time they were the single biggest MEMS producer. Uh, micro bolometers, um, micro optical MEMS, so that would be for switching, uh, telephone switching, micro spectrometers and so forth. And then the class that's really exploding is gyroscopes and accelerometers or generically inertial sensors, um, largely because they're uh, showing up in cell phones now and uh, the more they show up, the more of them people want. I don't know how many of you have seen some of these uh, augmented reality applications that are in the iPad and the iPhone now where you can, for example, hold up the phone and point at uh, something and it gives you some information about it. Uh, one example would be pointing it up at the sky and it tells you what star you're looking at. I find those augmented reality applications really compelling and to do them you need um, not you know, inertial sensing, you need uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers in the device to know which way it's pointed. Silicon microphones have also um, come in there. There's still a lot of growth potential there. They're used in uh, cell phones, of course, and anything where you want to um, record sound. Pressure sensors were uh, historically one of the first MEMS applications. They're used, used widely for environmental sensing. And uh, finally, inkjet heads, which uh, is a ongoing market, some well-established well players. So Coventer's software addresses all, you know, you can see that from here to here is all those applications, so that's a large part of the MEMS market. Um, we're also addressing, there's some interesting applications, emerging applications like energy scavenging or energy harvesting that uh, uh, Coventerware and Coventer's software is great for simulating. 
and uh, then uh, specialized measurement areas uh, like uh, micro tips for um, atomic force microscopes, and then RF MEMS, which to date have not been a large category, but I would, my personal belief is that RF MEMS, um, if they can be successful, and that, that's an if, um, could dwarf all of this other stuff put together because the reasons for using MEMS and RF are so compelling. Um, but they're also very challenging. And I, I, is there a, there's a wireless center at um, University of Michigan, so I know there's ongoing research here with, uh, by some of the faculty here, but there's a lot of potential still in that area. So what I didn't include in our focus is microfluidics and uh, microfuel cells, and I know from the registration that quite a few of you are doing microfluidics. We do have microfluidics solvers in Coventer's, uh, co in Coventerware, um, but it's not been an area of focus for a number of years, and um, at the moment we aren't doing a lot to enhance those solvers, so I just want to be upfront with people that, you know, this, there's areas where we continue really improving the software and trying to address them, and, and it's driven by this kind of market data. And the other areas like microfluidics where we've um, admittedly um, sort of uh, made a conscious decision to give it less attention, and part of the reason was that we found that uh, there was such a wide variety in microfluidics of what people wanted to do that it was very hard for us to develop tools that would serve multiple purposes. It seemed like every user had a different problem and we had to do some custom software development for it to address their problem and it just wasn't a um, business model that made a lot of sense for us. If the market changes and uh, there start to emerge some um, common needs amongst the microfluidics folks that we think we can identify, then that, that could change, but at the moment that's where we are. Um, another way of looking at the market is how it's distributed it, and, it, and what you see here, these are the, uh, this is the last data that was available from 2009 of the MEMS components, so only these packaged components that have a MEMS in them, um, what that revenue was. Um, the biggest for quite a while has been Texas Instrument with the digital light projector, an array of mirrors that's in these projectors. Um, and then Prominent amongst this list are inkjet players like HP is mainly inkjets. Um, Canon certainly is inkjets, Seiko, Epson, Lexmark, so the inkjet folks. There are only a few big guys at the top and then there's a, a lot of distribution of uh, folks. If the second most common thing in this list are inertial sensors and you see uh, Bosch there and ST Microlonic Electric electronics and ST has been the main beneficiary of this boom in use of inertial sensors in cell phones. They have products that have out um, distanced uh, in large part the field and um, are, are uh, present. And then uh, for example MEMS microphones, this company Knowles Electronics about in 2004 introduced the first MEMS microphone and today they're still the largest in the uh, silicon microphone business. <coughs> what, what is um, unusual about this compared to the electronics industry is that amongst these manufacturers, a lot of them have what are known as captive fabs. So they, they own the fab and, and um, produce, they, they design it, they produce it, they sell it and that's known as an integrated device manufacturer. So the, the, the um, comments from Yoel about this market, it's a, a fragmented market. There's very few applications still that are above 200 million in size, which in the bigger scheme of things is a relatively small business. And so what has to happen to, for the MEMS industry to grow is that we have to get past this uh, you design a product and you design a process at the same time and it's known as one product, one process, one package in the MEMS industry and that's kind of the, um, been an obstacle to um, more growth of the industry. Um, 
as part of that, they're talking here about software development. They're saying that firm, they're talking about firmware that goes into, so into the MEMS product. So the MEMS product is not just the sensor. It's a system consisting of a MEMS sensing element, but then also some um, mixed signal AC, uh, IC, um, to do the signal processing and possibly even a microprocessor to do digital uh, signal processing. So you have analog in, digital out, and uh, that microprocessor then needs some software. So the whole package is part of the product and part of the um, way that companies like us uh, can uh, provide more value is by servicing more of that um, system development. MEMS products have, um, it's been historically very uh, costly and time consuming to introduce a MEMS product. I often see articles, um, I, I used to see, I don't see them as often anymore. Somebody comes up with a new MEMS device in a university and they say, oh, it'll be in the stores in next year or two years. Well, the reality is the companies that are in the industry now spent anywhere from uh, five to 15 years developing their products and uh, spent a lot of money on it. Knowles microphones are a good example. It was fifth from the time they started development till the time they had a product on the market, it was 15 years. So what, what we're about is trying to um, change that and, and along with other uh, parts of the industry. So what's changing is that we now have demand from consumer electronics devices very different market than you had initially, um, certainly with uh, automotive applications. With all due respect to the Detroit area, automotive has very long product cycle times. Uh, even though they introduce a new car each year, the parts, the electronics that go into them are designed to last at least 10 years or more, and therefore they um, tend to lag behind and develop products a little more slowly than the consumer electronics industry. So that's one area of change and um, that um, use of MEMS in consumer electronics is, means you have to get them to market faster, you have to develop them, you have to improve them faster. And that um, requires uh, what we're calling a de democratization of MEMS uh, that means a shift from these companies that had everything under one roof to um, having uh, small companies and, uh, that can uh, design the device and then use a foundry that supplies a standard process. And um, toward that trend, we're starting to see just in the last two years the same thing that happened in the electronics industry in the 1990s. You have um, large foundries in Asia, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor is uh, by far the largest they, in, in electronics. It's some, they, they produce something like uh, 17 to 20 percent of all chips made worldwide. And they offer a set of standard process, processes for electronics. They are now announcing uh, a strategy to deliver standard processes for MEMS. And one of the poster childs for this approach is a company called Invincense. It's a, it was a startup that developed uh, the first commercially available or widely available MEMS gyroscope and they use as a foundry TSMC. Very successful, it was used initially for um, image stabilization and it's now um, in the iPhone 4. Uh, another player just supporting this trend, uh, Global Foundries, there were a number of uh, earlier companies, UMC and SMC that were in Taiwan and Singapore, Global, those foundries couldn't compete in the stay at the state of the art in electronics. It just got too costly and so they combined into a partnership that's now called Global Foundries and Global Foundries like TSMC is now announcing um, intention to do high volume manufacturing of MEMS with standard processes. So these are the, um, that's sort of the changing landscape in the market. In light of that, our our mission is to support the democratization of MEMS, to proliferate MEMS expertise, which we do. Um, we've had um, quite a bit of success with our products at the integrated device manufacturers, but through our university program offering a discount and uh, this to <coughs> uh, use at NN, 
IN is, an, is a perfect example, uh, training engineers to use it so that when you get, uh, go out, you'll be familiar with the um, software and uh, if you're working on a project that requires it, you'll recommend it to your manager and we'll all be happy. You'll be able to do your job well and Coventer will um, be able to continue to thrive. Um, increasing efficiency of the development process. So why is it that MEMS designs have taken tens of millions of dollars in four to ten years to time to market? And in a lot of cases it's because uh, they didn't have the simulation tools. They didn't try to, you know, it was always faster to go to the lab and build something, except it's not really faster to do that, that doing a lot of simulation can, you, can save you time. So that's part of our mission and uh, becomes more so more important now with consumer electronic devices so you can turn things around and also increasing integration of MEMS and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And the third um, aspect of our mission is to support a MEMS ecosystem that doesn't really exist today. What exists in semiconductors and CMOS, these independent foundries there's uh, EDA tool suppliers. The foundries will actually um, create design kits for their standard processes. And if you're a fabulous um, IC house, you get a design kit from TSMC or Global Foundries, and you use that design kit in your cadence tools or your synopsis tools to design your device. You don't have to have all this process knowledge. And that uh, same approach we think will um, work in MEMS and our software is designed to support ultimately um, having design kits for process design kits for MEMS. So um, that's some background on the market and um, now I'll go into a product overview. Let me remind myself where, where we are on time. Um, I'm going to start with Coventerware. That's the product that uh, it was introduced in 2001, but it was really a rebadging of our initial product, MEMCAD, so it's got the history of Coventerware goes back to uh, probably the mid, mid to early 90s, in fact. Um, and there are parts, by now, most, most there's, the code from that, those days is uh, largely gone, but you probably can still f find a few lines that are there from 1995. Um, and that product has been addressed mainly at MEMS designers, but as, a, as we said before, the MEMS product is not just the sensing component that you build with a MEMS process, it also involves some integrated circuit, and uh, so we need to, and, and it involved uh, collaboration with process engineers, so in 2004 we introduced a product called Simulator 3D, initially called Memulator, and uh, we'll talk about that. It's used for virtual fabrication, uh, finding out what your device is going to look like before you put it in the fab. And um, that tool has now proliferated widely and used in a lot of uh, universities and MEMS foundries as well as um, some non-MEMS foundries that we'll talk about. And then uh, starting in late 2009, we introduced a new product that we called MEMS Plus. It's really a, we regard it as a platform and that bridges um, the gap, we're, we're trying with MEMS Plus trying to bridge this, um, the needs of system and IC designers as well as MEMS designers. And that's the product we're going to spend, you don't um, have access yet to this product at NNIN, but we hope after hearing about it today that you'll add this to the suite of tools that are available. And so we'll give you um, the explanation and demo of that this morning and then go back and talk and more about Coventerware. So just quickly on Coventerware, there are three uh, parts of it. Uh, because it's MEMS, uh, the materials and description of the pro fabrication process is the starting point. You have to have some idea how you're going to build it. So we have a material properties database and process editor that's common to um, the modules. And um, we had uh, have, have a behavioral modeling tool or environment known as Architect 3D that's based on the Synopsis Sabre simulator and uh, that's um, been developed over the last 10 years, quite sophisticated 
However, I'm not going to talk too much about, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction, but not talk about it because in large part MEMS Plus, our new platform um, with the 2.0 release is a replacement for Architect. The part of Covenorware that's uh, widely used and known is the designer and anal analyzer model modules. Designer has 2D layout, um, 2D to 3D in a uh, module you don't really see. It's sort of in between the layout editor and the preprocessor to get a, a 3D solid model that you're then going to prepare for finite element analysis. And then an analyzer, we have this complete suite of um, multi-physics uh, solvers that are um, particularly to address the MEMS problems. So quick overview of Architect, because you're going to see similarities with where we went with MEMS Plus. Again, we have this uh, manufacturing description in the form of process um, description and material properties database. You create the design in a um, schematic editor, the way an electronic design is created. And this is, uh, for mechanical engineers, something of an un unnatural act to think about a mechanical device in terms of schematic. Um, however, the models under each of these schematic components were quite sophisticated. You could run simulations and get 2D plots, but Later on, we introduced a visualizer that really helped the mechanical engineers see what they were doing. That's called Scene 3D. Once you're happy with the design, then you have export filters to layout or 3D solid models. For designer, again, the same. We start, again, with the same material properties and uh, process description uh, that's used in architect and analyzer. Um, and we have a 2A, 2D layout editor with MEMS specific features. The layout and the process go into the solid modeler. And that builds, a, that's not something you see it when, when you uh, start to build a 3D model. It happens under the covers. And when it's done, it will pop up in our preprocessor. And the preprocessor, again, has lots of nice features for uh, MEMS uh, types of geometries. And also in the preprocessor, you access the automatic meshing uh, for MEMS. So we'll, I'll talk about that more at the 11 o'clock session. In Analyzer, um, our suite of field solvers, uh, technically the way we sell it, the meshing is actually part of Analyzer, but most people buy Designer and Analyzer together, so it's a, a technicality more than reality. And uh, this is a list of all the physics. Uh, first and foremost, electrostatics. That's done with a boundary element solver. Remember I told you I was an ocean engineer. Well, boundary elements were used to do water waves on um, water wave forces on ships and offshore structures. So that's my link into MEMS. Um, we use um, finite element solver for most of the other physics here, mechanics, coupled electromechanics, thermal. Some of these, like uh, piezo-resistive, is our own solver. The other ones are actually built on the um, Abacus solver, which is a very sophisticated commercial um, finite element solver, uh, one of the earliest ones to the market and still one of the best. Um, and then uh, we have other solvers. We have our own solver for electromagnetics. We, we have a method for um, analyzing package effects on MEMS. Um, and then Another area of uh, specialty is to do gas damping. And there we have uh, several ways of doing damping uh, with Reynolds solvers, Stokes solvers, and Navier Stokes solvers. And you kind of have to figure out what's um, applicable to your device. But that's something you won't find um, in other uh, packages. And then we, had, we have a, a suite of solvers for single and two-phase microfluidics. And, um, there's a lot of capability there, but uh, not, not something we'll go into much today. So um, the bread and butter for Covenorware has been this coupled electromechanics. And there's a module called CoSolve EM, the coupled electromechanics solver. The idea is um, electrostatics are best done with boundary elements. You don't need volume elements, and oftentimes 
uh, for example, if you have a gap that's going to, like on an RF switch, something that's going to close, it can be very challenging to use volume elements in a case like that. You've got to mesh up that volume, and as the switch closes, what happens to those elements? They start to have bad aspect ratios, and, and that's quite a challenging problem. So with boundary elements, all you mesh is the surface for the electrostatics, and you've got generally some voltage bias across between a stationary electrode and some moving part. Now, uh, that force that's created electrostatically is highly nonlinear. It's proportional to 1 over the gap. And um, whereas the mechanics can be linear or nonlinear, so we, we get a force out of the electrostatic solver, and then we go to the finite element solver, and we apply that force and find out how the mechanics change. And this is done iteratively. Um, until you get a convergence for uh, an equilibrium point. That, um, and that's, that's what COSOLV does. That was the original part of Coventerware. And a typical analysis that you do with that is to find the pull-in voltage. Um, so you keep increasing the uh, voltage bias until you, s and you s look at the gap between the, two, the uh, moving part and, and the electrode and wait till um, this curve uh, reaches a a uh, point where it's, uh, the, the system is unstable, and that point it snaps, the uh, two pieces snap together. So that's sort of the classic MEMS coupled electrostatics problem. Other physics that um, are handled in analyzer piezoelectric effects um, are important. Uh, there's, um, for RF applications, a lot of uh, work has been done on bulk acoustic mode resonators for high frequency RF. Those resonators would be put together to do filters. Um, <coughs> now there's uh, interest in using um, piezoelectric effects for energy scavenging or energy harvesting. Another um, special specialty physics is piezo resistance. Uh, that uh, was used and is used uh, widely in pressure sensors, and there's some bulk fabricated accelerometers that use piezo resistance as the sensing mechanism. Um, and then in all of these MEMS, uh, you have to care about what are the energy loss mechanisms. And there we're talking about gas damping, thermoelastic damping, anchor losses, and so forth. And those are also covered, um, and I'll talk about those more later. And finally, of course, microfluidics. <coughs> Here's some, um, just a small number of examples of applications of Covenerware a uh, accelerometer where you have these electrostatic comb drive to get high capacitance and you're sensing uh, this thing. The accelerometer is uh, mostly passive. It sits there. Uh, you apply a uh, alternating bias voltage to the um, comb stators. And when it moves, then you get a current out of, this, um, out of the uh, stators. And that's what you're detecting. Uh, here's an example of an RF switch where you're um, applying a, this would be a ohmic switch, one that's based on resistance. There are also capacitive switches, um, but where you're trying to uh, pull two pieces together with electrostatic force. Uh, here's a, a, f a bulk acoustic uh, resonator based on piezoelectric effects, um, and a pressure sensor where you've got a membrane. This one is obviously a bulk KOH fabricated from these. Uh, characteristic sidewall angles. And then on top of this membrane, you might have some piezo-resistive layers that are used for pressure sensing. I mentioned the uh, opportunity for RF. And, and, and worldwide, a lot of our customers have been using our software to develop RF MEMS. Um, but very few of the products they're working on are actually in the market, which tells us something. It's hard. <laughs> it means that the doing, doing uh, RF MEMS is hard. So there's a lot of companies have invested a lot of time and money in RF switches. Um, and they have uh, different applications within the phone. But basically, a MEMS switch can uh, have lower power loss than a solid state switch. So that's why uh, there's why people keep trying is that it, there's a the payoff at the end. Another area is uh, resonators, and one of the applications would be uh, 
band selection, so you have uh, phones that have to operate on all these different bands. And again, if you could do it with MEMS-based filters as opposed to solid-state filters, there's an opportunity for power savings, and as we know, keeping that battery going is an important uh, criteria for the overall performance of the phone. Um, Veractors have a similar um, use. They're uh, variable capacitors, basically, um, and at least one company that actually that's a spin-off from Coventer called Wisepry is very close to having a, a, a Veractor on the market. They're working closely with Samsung. And uh, what you have is, a, in fact, an array of these, and it's used to choose the um, band that the, uh, the input band for the uh, cell phone. And then uh, inductors are maybe uh, on the edge of being MEMS because there's not really anything moving, but they are 3D. They do have 3D geometry. In microfluidics, um, commercially, the inkjets are the biggest success, and we have a solver in our suite called Bubble Drop Sim that addresses inkjets, um, has some ability to include um, forcing from membranes, uh, and that's been a large and successful market long term. Maybe, maybe we all end up walking around with iPads and Kindles and people need less paper and so the inkjet market decreases, but that hasn't happened so far. So far it just keeps growing. Uh, micro total analysis systems, their lab on chip, include lab on chip and different ways of doing that and we have uh, some of the tools address that and there are various concepts. Um, a few things now are coming into the market, and then another, a third area of um, activity is microfuel cells. Wanted to mention with Coventerware that it's not a, um, while it is self-contained that you can go into Coventerware, do your work, and um, get what you need. Uh, we realize there's a lot of other tools out there, and so we support a lot of the standard um, input formats and output formats. So if you have some other layout editor, as long as it can output one of these formats, then we can read it into the Coventerware layout editor, if only to then go into the solid modeler, which is an easy way to create your 3D model. And likewise, if you create the layout in the layout editor, we have a choice of standard formats um, for exporting the 2D layout. Uh, you don't have to start with layout. You could come in with 3D model, and we have uh, support some of the standard 3D solid modeling formats and export those as well. And then even at the mesh level, we import certain mesh formats, including ANSYS uh, format, and we can export um, results fields and both the mesh model and results fields in, in several uh, well-known formats, including the ANSYS result format. So that's um, a quick view of the compatibility. Okay, moving on to Coventerware. Um, so that's, that's a quick summary of Coventerware. Let's move on to Simulator 3D for process engineers. And what it does is virtual fabrication. So you think about an actual fab. You start with a wafer. You start with a 2D mask set. You move that wafer through uh, a, a production line following some recipe. And it could be a partial sequence or a full sequence if you're uh, at the final stages of product development. You get a wafer, and then you want to look at what you built. And you do that with uh, FIB and SEM equipment, and it's very uh, time-consuming and expensive to look at that. So conceptually, virtual fabrication means you take an area of interest on the wafer. It's not computationally, it's <coughs> it would be, uh, you, could be, you could do the whole wafer, but there's, it w you'd have to be uh, somewhat patient. Uh, you mimic what the equipment does geometrically, and that's um, key part of this. So we mimic what the equipment does geometrically, we create a 3D model, and now you can visualize what's going on. So for this to be valuable, it has to be pretty realistic. And uh, what we found is that, in fact, the models that you can build with Simulator 3D are realistic enough to, for um, our customers to really get some um, use out of them. So the input uh, 
is again GDS2 layout, only GDS2 layout, so it has to be converted to that form. And a process description. The process description is similar to Coventerware, but much more detailed. Um, the user interface is the same, but it, it, it has a lot more, uh, there, there are differences in the description you enter because we need more detail. And then we use a, a unique um, voxel-based algorithm, which is kind of like uh, 3D pixels is the way I describe it. So you build this, it's a digital 3D model. You build the model up out of these voxels, and um, then you're able to do visualization of it and, um, simula and, and export simulation meshes. And the thing was that uh, what we found was that if you try to do this to get to here with conventional solid modeling algorithms, they're not robust. They, you do things like etching or uh, conformal depositions, and the conventional solid modelers are pretty fussy. They, 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 um, they'll just um, not do what you want to do in a lot of cases. And this voxel modeling approach turned out to be very robust as, and uh, works with thin thin coatings and so forth. And um, the resulting models then were things that uh, customers had tried to build with conventional 3D CAD tools, couldn't, and then they started using Simulator and were able to do it. Because of the nature of this process description, we can customize it to any process technology. And some of the things that are, um, customers are using it for, MEMS processes, of course, um, it's being used at several of the independent MEMS foundries as a uh, design check. Before they go to FAB, they insist on running the customer's uh, layout through Simulator 3D to make sure there are no problems with it. Um, it's also being used um, and can simulate CMOS uh, logic. Um, we have um, customers who are, a number of customers who are using it to develop um, advanced memory cells. Oh, in the area of CMOS, one of the cu customers is, the, is using it on, this, on the uh, next generation CMOS nodes, which are down at 22 nanometers and 20 nanometers, and um, getting um, a lot of use out of Simulator. Um, for image sensors, a customer was able to optimize their fabrication process, hard disk heads, and now um, has applicability to chip stacking or uh, with through, through silicon vias. So uh, some of the benefits that customers have seen for process development and integration, they're able to use this just to communicate amongst the process engineers. Pri previously, they were liter literally drawing pictures on a whiteboard or, or drawing uh, diagrams in PowerPoint that are certainly not uh, to scale. And, and uh, so just as a communication tool, but they've um, been able to actually predict issues before they put wafers through the fab, and that uh, saves a lot of money, the value of a um, 300 million millimeter wafer um, for a state-of-the-art process is, um, I think, well north of $10,000. So if you can uh, save a few of those wafers, you've saved some significant money. Um, just for documentation, uh, Again, when a process is developed in, uh, for memory or anything else, it has to be documented carefully to train the fab personnel. And we have some of the leading companies using it to create documentation. And there's a possibility, too, of using it to do failure analysis. Certainly in MEMS, something goes wrong. You don't, you're not sure about it. You can have a hypothesis about what might be going on and then test that hypothesis in Simulator 3D and I uh, have several s examples of customers doing that. All right, so that's a quick um, tour. Again, we'll be talking about Simulator 3D more this afternoon after lunch. And um, now our, our new, um, all new platform called MEMS Plus, um, which is more addressed at um, system development. I feel like I'm switching rolls of film here. Okay. So again, we talked about the idea that MEMS sensor, and this is uh, on the top here, we have a DLP pixel, an old design. And if you look at 
that device underneath it is some electronics. It happened to be fabricated. It was relatively simple electronics, in this case an SRAM cell. But nevertheless, there are system issues. When you array these pixels and you want to switch on a particular pixel, the parasitics of the interconnect and the parasitics of these mirrors affect how fast that mirror switches. And that's something that the uh, companies that develop these kinds of devices, these um, mirror arrays, want to be able to simulate. And uh, that's what we're trying to address with MEMS Plus. The, um, so MEMS design requires collaboration. You've got uh, system designers or system architects, IC engineers, layout designers. All those folks are doing electronics, but they need a MEMS component in their design. How are they going to get that component? Well, what happens is the MEMS designers use finite element tools. And we've already talked about what Coventerware can do. The IC guys use tools like MATLAB Simulink or Cadence Virtuoso, and they work in a different world. And how are these guys going to talk? And, and the reality today is that the communication between those groups of engineers and companies is very um, ad hoc, shall we say. And it's done, it's done differently in every company. The MEMS engineers have to somehow handcraft a model that's used by the IC guys. If the MEMS de design changes, they have to change their model, they have to validate it, and so forth. And you can appreciate that creating this model may not be so easily because you take a, here's a SEM of a part of a accelerometer. This is a complex 3D uh, geometry. How do you take this complex 3D behavior and put it into a block on a Simulink schematic or in a Cadence Virtuoso schematic? <coughs> so the, the um, first answer that a lot of people have tried is uh, known as reduced order modeling. And the idea is that you'll um, do a lot of finite element simulation, and then you'll boil your, your simulation down to uh, a reduced order model. And there are various techniques uh, for doing that. For example, Krilov subspace model order reduction is one that's uh, used, um, actually not, avail not, not widely available, but something that could be used. So the approach is very flexible. It's time consuming, because anytime you're doing FEA, it's time, time consuming. And it's also the model that you get in the IC environment over here, this symbol that you get in your IC environment doesn't, isn't parametric. And we'll talk about why that matters. Um, and it's hard to include. It's one thing to get a linear model, reduced order model, quite another to include some of the nonlinearities that could be important in MEMS, and it also requires a lot of expertise to do this. So in terms of democratization of MEMS, this is not ideal. Why do people want parametric models? Well, we've talked to customers, and what happens is uh, you'll have environmental variables or device geometry variables or parameters that need to change as part of the design. And every time the MEMS design changes MEMS team changes their design, they have to revalidate whatever models they provided to their colleagues in IC development. So uh, that task of revalidating a reduced order model is time consuming and, and, it, and it's also not automated. The circuit team also just needs, they, they don't need access to the whole MEMS design, but they want to be able to optimize the system and if the model is non-parametric, then the, it shuts off that possibility. Get a, I don't think this wasn't for me, was it? Can you ask a question? Sure, please. Um, well, first having the variables there. So parametric means, uh, for example, let's suppose your device is affected by temperature. Um, the temperature wouldn't show up directly in the model, but maybe um, the um, Young's modulus is a function oh, so of temperature. Put functions in as opposed to just putting in numbers. 
Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Parameterized it with a function. Mm -hmm. In some cases, if let's say it's the length of a tether or something, then the then the parameter is the length of the tether, but that um, length might also. Yeah. 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 That's that's right. So um, another aspect of the importance of parametric models is that yield is. It's one thing to build one working device, but to get the yield up, um, it, you have to be able to do um, Monte Carlo studies that um, take into account manufacturing variations. And again, that's not possible if, if the MEMS model is not parametric. So another approach to doing um, behavioral modeling in a circuit simulator is a, a lump parameter model where you come up with an equivalent circuit <coughs> that captures the behavior of your mechanical device. And <coughs> these, these um, can be somewhat parametric. They can handle um, a lot of nonlinearities, but it depends on how, you, how um, good you are at writing these models. And certainly in some of the MEMS pioneers, the the few big companies, they have developed a lot of sophistication and ability to write these models, but um, that knowledge has been built up over years, and uh, if you start from scratch, that's not an easy thing to do, and that's um, what we're trying to basically to supply this type of model, but from a tool that's um, very easy to use, that's, that's what MEMS Plus does. So our first answer to this challenge was Coventerware Architect, um, partly because we had um, Synopsys Sabre, looking back 10 years ago, was um, really was and still is very good for multi-physics simulation. And so we had this Coventerware Architect tool where you created a schematic, and each block on that schematic could be um, MEMS building blocks. So this might be an electrostatic comb, a suspension component, a, uh, another suspension component here, a, a perforated plate with an electrode underneath and an anchor. <coughs> and we built up a library of these elements. Each one, the electrostatic combs, for example, were extensively parameter. Uh, every aspect of it where the perforations of it, there were parameters that the user could could enter and they could define variable names that for those parameters. So it did the parameterization pretty well, but it wasn't the most natural thing <coughs> to use because um, what, what does a schematic like this mean in context of a MEMS? So about three, four years ago, we tried to address that by introducing a module called Scene3D where you could click a button and get a 3D view of what your model was, and that certainly helped. And we found after we introduced that, more people uh, started using Architect to do their MEMS modeling. The beauty of it compared to finite element modeling is that the simulations run lickety-split. I mean, you're talking a few minutes for a simulation. This is a transient simulation of a gyroscope compared to half an hour, an hour, multiple hours for finite element analysis. So once you built your model, you got really fast simulations, which was conducive to doing a lot of design exploration. Why is it? If you have a simulation that's using similar physics, and you've got a, why is it that you can do this so much faster? Well, the, the, the um, models, something like an elect, there, there, there are certain parts of it that are modeled quite well by analytic or semi-analytic means. Uh, the best example is electrostatic comb drives. To do those with boundary elements, it turns out you need a heck of a lot of boundary elements to get the um, fields right. And yet, um, and what we do in uh, Architect is a conformal mapping approach. It's like taking a 2D slice through those fingers. And you're able to do the conformal mapping. That's to evaluate the conformal mapping is very, very fast. And it turns out it's, it's um, you know, almost as accurate as the best boundary element solutions. So, so you have the um, 
ability, especially with electrostatics, to get very accurate answers in a, in a fraction of the time. And, you know, it's just uh, take advantage of analytics or semi-analytic approaches when they, when they work. So, um, and we also added, I don't have, uh, unfortunately I didn't get the video, there's a video showing the motion. So you can actually see the uh, motion after you do it, you know, going from a, a plot like this, which isn't, doesn't really tell you what's going on with the device to a, a video, uh, helps a great deal in understanding what the device is doing. So with um, development of Architect over a period of um, more than 10 years, we were able to address a lot of the different kinds of devices that our customers presented to us, DLP mirrors, various kinds of switches, um, inertial sensors, accelerometers, and gyros, and this is just a beginning. And we basically, as we worked with some of our key customers, they said, well, we need a model to do this. We added it to the library, and by probably 2007, the number of requests for new models started to taper off, which meant that we had addressed a lot of the common needs in the market for, in, in, for MEMS. So, well, unfortunately, we had this great modeling technology, but it was trapped in um, Synopsis Sabre, which is not widely used for ID, IC design. And over the years, we had fortunately um, ended up moving a lot of our models into um, C++ so they would run faster and the um, modeling language that's available in these simulators has limitations and we got around it by doing that. So um, we realized that we could take our models and instead of running them in Saber, we would run them in simulators that the electronics folks do use, namely um, for IC design, Cadence Virtuoso is the most popular environment, and for system design, MATLAB Simulink. So our new tool, MEMS uh, Plus, provides a, a very slick uh, user interface that Sean's going to demo for you, where you actually enter, it's still a, underneath, it's like a 3D schematic editor. Um, you still enter, you enter it in 3D, which feels a lot more natural. And then you're able to export uh, blocks to the Cadence environment for simulation and for uh, layout, actually export P cells to Cadence, or export a MEMS block to MATLAB Simulink for simulation. So actually creating the MEMS you do in 3D in a natural environment. And then uh, you can still go from this design into finite element analysis, and that's necessary in some cases to verify the uh, simulations that you do in these other environments. So for, for um, we have two versions of the product now. One works with um, MATLAB Simulink and uh, the other with Cadence Virtuoso, but the design entry part is the same. So we enter the 3D design in a module called Innovator that draws on our library, um, long developed library of components for MEMS. When you've finished your design, you export a symbol into the Simulink environment and connect other components to it. If you're a MEMS designer, you just need some sources uh, and um, monitors to figure out what's going on. If you're a system designer, then there's a lot more you can add in Simulink. You simulink, simulate it. Um, it uses something called the S function interface that's available in MATLAB and Simulink to access our library during the simulations. And when you're done with the simulations, you have the ability to visualize in three dimensions what, what's, what that simulation did. Cadence uh, works similarly, same design entry, but now you have to export various uh, so-called views of your design. One is the symbol view that goes into the schematic editor. Once you're once you've got a, a schematic, the, again, the MEMS designer might just cr connect a few sources. The uh, IC designer would put a bigger circuit around it. They can simulate in uh, one of the Cadence simulators, Spectre and Ultrasim being the most um, 
popular ones, but there are other variants as well. And uh, export P cells or parametric cells to the Cadence Virtuoso layout editor. And just as with MATLAB Simulink, if you want to see what the simulation actually did in 3D, you have the ability to visualize it in one of the windows in MEMS Plus. So that's the high level view of MEMS Plus. Uh, going back to, remember we talked about this change in uh, the MEMS market and uh, to support that change that Covenor is not now just about the MEMS device design but the system design. If you look at Cadence Virtuoso, what it offers to that market, you have a schematic design capture in their schematic entry tool. They have something called the analog design environment which is a, basically a simulation manager that provides a lot of functionality, ability to do uh, Monte Carlo and optimizations and all of that's managed in the analog design environment. You have the uh, layout editor. Once you've got a design, you've got to have a layout which might be custom or semi-custom to get to manufacturing. And the layout then has to be verified with tools like DRC or LVS. And so for each of those red blocks that are provided by Cadence, Coventer is um, moving toward providing a corresponding MEMS component. So we already provide this MEMS symbol, we provide the MEMS netlist, we provide our library of models that go into the simulations, and we provide P cells. The, the area that we haven't addressed yet is the design rule checks and layout versus schematic, but that's something uh, that's in progress. And supporting all that is the MEMS Plus framework, the manu manufacturing description, the uh, 3D user interface, and the 3D result viewer. So it, it kind of fits together with this cadence flow to provide a complete um, environment for MEMS Plus IC design. So I'm going to do a really quick tour because I, I don't want to eat into your time too much. Design entry in MEMS Plus, you start with process. <coughs> There's a first tab is materials database. Every process variable can be parametric, so here's one that depends on temperature. Temperature shows up in your list of variables. Um, you have the second tab is a process editor, similar to um, Coventerware, but now every uh, item in there can be a variable. And um, the uh, process, each process step makes reference to materials that you previously entered. So there's a dependency of the process on the materials that you entered. And uh, material and process parameters, again, can now be part of the list of variables. Uh, we talked earlier why process variables um, we're trying to support, although we're working toward a, um, a fabulous model for MEMS design, one still has to be able to access the process parameters. Now the design entry starting from a, a blank canvas and in innovator, the user adds um, components. They see the uh, variables that were exposed from the process um, and they add components from a library. Here's this uh, component library on the right and can start adding components. So here we'll add a, um, a suspension component. We specify the parameters for the component and voila we have that 3D uh, suspension show up and all the parameters of, of that suspension can be all um, variables. We go on and complete a design. Here's a complete uh, accelerometer design and again those uh, the pieces of this design are each, underneath each one is a behavioral model, a sophisticated analytical behavior model. They'll, those models are not yet um, mechanically connected, so we have a mechanical connection view and we automatically, unlike in the architecture, it automatically makes these mechanical connections. And there's also electrical connector view so you can uh, define uh, which things are electrically connected. You import um, the model into Simulink and you can see here's Simulink and there's a MEMS Plus menu there. You import your 
MEMS Plus Design. It's a format called 3D SCA for 3D schematic. <coughs> and you get a symbol with pins on it that correspond to um, the inputs to the MEMS, some of which are mechanical. Any, if you double click on it, any parameters like temperature that you chose to expose in the symbol are available. So this, in this case, there was a set of parameters. Um, it outputs the capacitance of electrostatic, uh, the electrostatic parts of the model. And um, you have inputs that correspond to the position or acceleration inputs to the device on the left side of the symbol. I think I'm going to, um, so the first two pins on the left are the reference frame motion. You have voltage inputs on the lower part, and then force inputs on the left side, and on the right side, position outputs and capacitance outputs. So the MEMS designer is going to complete that system, put some pieces around it to stimulate and to measure. They confirm the behavior of the device performance in Simulink by running the play button, and they get a 2D plot that might show the, uh, this might look, looks like it's uh, pull in and then release of, of some electrostatic device. There are various kinds of analysis you want to run. DC analysis is to get the static equilibrium. Um, modal analysis to get the mode shapes of the device. And finally, uh, small signal AC analysis to get the harmonic behavior of the device. And you get a plot, and again with um, harmonic analysis, particularly, you'd like to be able to see the um, mode shape so you can uh, see that harmonic analysis, plot it also in, in, in the MEMS Plus interface, pick on a peak, and then vi visualize, um, animate that mode of motion. So to summarize there for MEMS Plus, uh, there are three types of simulation, and Chum is going to show these to you, DC transfer, small signal AC, and transient analysis. And um, it's designed uh, to take full advantage of all the capabilities that are already there in Simulink. There's a control system toolbox, optimization, custom scripting. It's basically an open framework, and MEMS Plus for Simulink plugs into that. Very quickly, the model library, you have three sets of mechanical components, rigid plates, suspensions, and flexible plates with various add-ons that let you build MEMS. Um, Here's just a fun example, putting together a butterfly. You've got a rigid plate as the fuselage here, uh, some beams as the head, um, flexible plates as the wings, and then you can uh, ex excite that up and down and you get your butterfly, even the antenna, the uh, antennae are oscillating up and down from these models. <coughs> so again, MEMS Plus um, has been applied to the full range of uh, various kinds of MEMS because it's built on the library that we created over many years with, um, with uh, Architect, and we've just continued building on that. I'm, I'm going to skip through. Here's an example. Again, these simulations are done in MEMS Plus of an array of LeMay mode resonators. A disk gyro done in MEMS Plus and showing <coughs> you're trying to um, capture um, vibration modes, bulk vibration modes of this gyro, and you can see from the match of these frequencies, this is MEMS plus, this is Covenorware, that um, it's, it's quite accurate. So to sum it up, <coughs> the MEMS designers worked in finite element, you know, 3D world, finite element analysis, and there was just no way, no easy way for them to get from their world to the IC designers who work in uh, out at an algorithmic level in Simulink or behavioral or implementation level in Virtuoso, no, no bridge between them. That's, that's the bridge MEMS Plus is providing. <coughs> and uh, beyond what we've shown you, we see it as a platform for, for enabling this um, democratization of MEMS, that we start it with the MEMS Plus platform. It works with Virtuoso. It works with uh, Simulink for system design. And uh, we have this MEMS Plus library. One of the things that 
we'll, we'll be developing with partners over the years is uh, re reference design kits, um, methodologies for ver verifying the MEMS design similar to what you have in IC, and uh, ultimately process design kits and a, and a vehicle for delivering MEMS device IP. And there's a, in terms of the ecosystem, Covenor is touching many of these uh, players, the electronic design automation vendors, the MEMS foundries, integrated design, device manufacturers, CMOS foundries, and, and so on. And uh, we're in a nice place to be um, supporting this uh, change in the way MEMS are um, designed and manufactured. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Sham who's going to do a, um, Sham's going to show you, uh, build a model of a Veractor in MEMS Plus, uh, because it's a demo, the model is relatively simple, and uh, show you simulation and Simulink. Any, um, any questions before we go to Sham's demo? Okay. You gonna sit up or stand? Yeah, okay. So I'd remind you again of the um, signing up for the support sessions this afternoon. Sign up sheets right here, um, and one sheet that you need to leave here, but put in a time slot and.